Welcome to another episode of Follow the Brand TV. I am your host, Grant McGaw, CEO of Five Star BDM, a five star personal brand and business development company. I want to take you on a journey through another deep dive into the world of personal branding and business development using compelling personal stories, business conversations, and tips to improve your brand. By listening to the Follow the Brand TV series, you will differentiate yourself from the competition and build trust with prospective clients and employers. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. Make it one that will set you apart, build confidence, and reflect who you are. Building your five-star personal brand is a great way to improve your skills and knowledge. If you have any questions for me or any of my guests, please email me at grant.mcgaw at fivestarbdm.com. Now, let's begin with our next episode on the Follow the Brand TV. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Follow Brand TV. We're going to have a special guest. I met him during the Acaba Men Who Lead Awards Ceremony back in October. And Mr. Pete Kennedy is going to join me tonight. I like what he does because he's helping the youth to grow. He is the CEO and founder of Educating Men and Youth about leading and living. And he's also an author as well. I want you to envision our, our mentors, people that have lived certain ways in this community, coming back to our youth and actually showing them the way, showing how to live right. They understand what they're going through now. They are uniquely positioned to begin to help this next generation not to make the mistakes that can lead them into a life of setback. So we don't want that to happen. So what I'd like to do now, I'm going to play you a short you know, clip. I want you to give you a better understanding of what, who Akab is about. I want you to get a better understanding about men who lead and what that was about. And then we're going to bring Pete Kennedy up and we're going to have a great conversation tonight. So thank you for tuning in. Dozens of people from across the country gathering at Nova Southeastern University for the ICABA Salutes Men Who Lead event, which was sponsored by Truist. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard of a lot of people today. You know, we particularly have some, some, some younger leaders here with us today. Remember I said about connecting, I talked about collaborating and building a community. If there's something that you know, someone that you know, a resource that you have available to you, come up to Zalen and say, hey, I know somebody that can help you with that. I'm serious. I mean, I guarantee there is somebody right now sitting in this room that knows something, somebody or of some resource that could help him. Braver Theater started as a vision when I was in sixth grade, when I knew I wanted to own a theater company and one day even a theater building. Um, and since then it has matriculated and it has grown since I attended Florida a and University where I studied business and theater. Thank you so much for pouring into young people such as myself, um, your wisdom. The award signifies those who not only achieve excellence in their industry, but build up their communities in the process. What I do is access the capital, and I advocate for entrepreneurs. I'm glad to be here at Kaba. What brought me here is that I was nominated as an honoree for the Saluting Men Who Lead. Um, and it was great to be honored by your peers that understand the work that you put in. Um, but more than that, it's great to be in a room of black honorees, black men that are making a change in the community and the culture for the, better and for the betterment of our culture. Mr. Brown is the founding partner. I do what I do because I know that there are so many others out there that need a, a opportunity 
that need a chance, that need someone to stand up and fight for them. And it is my honor to do so on a daily basis. ICABA is known for creating an atmosphere where you can connect, collaborate, and build communities. And this event did just that. Attendees were given time to build relationships and enjoy a delicious meal together. This is actually our second in-person event in three years, which is highly unusual for a company that has done 300 events over the past 12 years. So I am really, really happy and excited to be in a room with people that we can actually As touch. a woman, I go to so many events where women are being honored, and so rarely do I see prominent black men being honored. And I think that is such a service because there are so many men doing so many things that I didn't even know, and I've been living here for years. And Hutch has provided, and Cobb has provided a platform for the rest of the world to see it. There were 15 chosen for the ICABA Salutes Men Who Lead Award. The honorees, a culmination of high-profile industries, nonprofits, and government. One of the first things that I set out doing is setting the vision for people. And I think you should never assume that people know what it is you're trying to achieve. Uh, no matter when you're, when you're visionary and you want to move forward quickly, there are always people in the back that are scared. Uh, we've set up these same types of platforms, um, but never on a global level, only on a local. So I salute ICABA as well for the excellent job they're doing. Thank you very much. First, thank you to ICABA and thank you uh, as well for making me a part of such a magnificent cohort of honorees. Um, first, I want to report out, leaders always have to tell the truth and speak well of their peers. Our table has met the challenge. We are connecting, collaborating. We got all kinds of connections we worked out. Right, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to do one thing for me. Can you everybody put the hands up? Okay, all right. Now, Jerome and Terry, I've been a nonprofit um, executive director for the last 25 years. And one of the things I promised my board of directors is that I will shake hands with everybody before I leave. So I fulfilled my promise. <laughs> I wish, but I just want to say, ladies, thank you. Many of the honorees giving great thanks for the Men Who Lead Award and being recognized for their superpower. This high-tech hybrid event was shot from every angle for everyone watching to feel like they were in the room. My dad was in a lot of pain, and I remember asking my mom, what's wrong? He's like, well, we don't have money for your dad's pain medication or what have you, and... It, it was, it just hurt me so bad. I had a belief at that moment that said, I hate money. I hate money. Anything you hate does not flow into your life, right? Anything that you what? Hate does not flow into your life. And why did I hate money? Because I believed the world would be better without money. Like it's not fair. It's not fair that we can't have medical care because of money. It just didn't seem fair to me. And so for years and years, I hated money. Then I met my dad when I was 18 years old. Incredible black women raised me, a grandmother and a mother. Yes, I did meet my dad, but he was more about business than family. You cannot be about business and, be, and call yourself successful if you don't take care of your own. For the first time, ICABA World Network also establishing an award in memory of Dr. John W. Ruffin Jr. for his legacy of excellence, professionalism, and philanthropy. Someone paved the way. They helped you along the way. And I never forget that I am where I am and who I am because of others who came into my life. So remember that. God bless you, and may he shower you with blessings. Thank you. Mr. George Tinsley Sr., the first recipient of the John W. Ruffin Jr. Business and Civic Award. So you get in the middle. You are the awardee, so we have to put you in the middle. I, I just want to say thank you. It's a 
great honor. The Ruffin family, well known, well known in our business, in the aviation business. And of course, I've uh, followed the track record of all the the work that is done by by you, your husband, and your family. So, congratulations on what you've done, and thank you for the honor. Remember, we're going to do three things, right? Connect, collaborate, and build a community. So, I want to see you in the community. You're going to get your invite. I want to see you show up. And you know what? Don't worry about what anybody else is doing. You do your part. Hey, well, we want to thank the ICABA World Community for what they're doing in the Men Who Lead program and program for women as well early in the year. And this has been great. So I met Pete during this particular uh, section of time. And I want to bring him up. Can we bring Pete up on screen? Yes, 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 yes. yes bring that energy. We want to bring that energy because <laughs> able to moderate and narrate a very, very good um, uh, panel. Yeah that particular event. So I want to first allow you to introduce yourself and let's get going with your interview so we know a little bit more about yourself. Well, thank you first, Grant, I must say, for giving me an opportunity to speak on your platform. I definitely appreciate it. Um, as one who actually does hosting as well, I know that it's, you know, we very silly, you know, handpick those that we want to actually have that conversation with. So I'm really honored to be here and thank you. As I watch the introduction, I'm getting emotional. I'm clapping. <laughs> uh, that ICABA event was, was, I would say, uh, a tremendous event. And again, again big up to, um, you know, Mr. Hutchinson and his team over there at ICABA, who's doing a wonderful job. And again, thank you for, for, for the honor, the honor. I appreciate it. Um, who is Pete Kennedy is, 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 is the question. And I would say Pete is just a, a guy who has really understood his talents. And that is to connect with people and just help people to truly get over the hump of, of saying, hey, I am stuck. And um, ever since I was a little boy, it's always been about people. So um, I am originally from the island of Jamaica, moved there from the age of 17 and has been since been in the state since now over 20 odd years. Um, love to eat, right? I think that's come from the Caribbean. But I also have a passion to speak and 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 teach, and also have those moments that I would say the the, the camaraderie, having that one on one coaching moment with men and and young people that I can help get there. So um, that's pretty much be yeah, Pete. Oh no, no, we ain't gonna let you get off that easy. Because <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, when I was at that Akaba event, the thing that resonated with me. Now, my son-in-law is from Jamaica. He's from the Kingston area in, um, I think, a Spanish town, right? Yeah. And they just had a beautiful daughter, married my, my a be they have a beautiful daughter. He married my daughter, right? So I always want to get the feel of what, what was Jamaica like? Well, what is it really like? And I, you know, you have such an accent, Manny. I mean, you take us there. You take us there. <laughs> but you, you know, this is about our youth because you live that life that our, some of our youth are living Mm -hmm. to some key intersections along the road that you pivoted and you changed. Take us back to Jamaica growing up and, and walk us through to that point of intersection where you made some changes. Well, I want to say, man, I'm born and raised in the city, Kingston, similar to, I would say, not too far from Spanish Town. Um, the hustle and bustle was real. You know, it, it was the survival of the survival. But I, I always like to say this, um, Grant, is I do not want to take away any blessings from my parents. Um, I, I never went to bed hungry. I, I only wore what we would call a hole in the shorts pants is because my friends had a hole in their shorts. Um, I walked bare feet because my friend walked bare feet and I didn't want to be the only one with a pair of shoes on. Not that it was expensive, but I had a pair of shoes. So I definitely never want to take away the credit when we talk about what my parents have set me up for for success. Um, my parents gave me a good life. As a Jamaican, I do not like cold water touching my back. And that's rare because as a young man growing up, my, my mom had a, a water heater in the house and we would, we would, you know, take warm showers. So those were the little things that my mom did 
to bring a little bit of, I would say, comfort to the environment in the home. But where the home resided in the community was a different ball game. Mm. So, you know, when mom wasn't there and was dad wasn't there, you know, the only thing back then, we didn't have the internet and social media like today where my sons can actually tap on their tablet and spend two hours reading something. The only thing we had to do if we weren't actually holding a book was go on the street corner and hang out with your friends because that's where the entire community met. Um, so what I did as a young boy growing up in Jamaica, though, is I was really involved in sports. Mm. I, I played a lot of soccer growing up, um, played, you know, high school and, and I would say community soccer. And from an early age during those days, um, I would wonder why my friends, because in Jamaica, we would play on the streets. You know, we, we didn't have like a soccer field every time to access. So we'd play on the streets and the car would have to pass and we'd have to get out the way every time and let the car pass and go back. We would have to move the goals, Grant. So we put stones up as gold and every time a car is coming, we would move the goal. Or the guy who's driving the car, no, let me put the car in a position that I drive over the stones, right? So that way they don't actually destroy their car. Um, but I would have supper on a Sunday and the older guys would call me to pick the soccer team and I wasn't even playing. And my mom would ask me, why are they calling you to pick the team? And I was like, I don't know. And when I asked them, they would say, because nobody questioned me and I was the youngest one then. So I always tell people that there was leadership always and our talents are always in us from birth, but we just truly need additional leaders or matured leaders to help nurture that, right? I didn't have anybody to say, Pete, you're, you're truly that, that leader. How do we nurture that so you can actually be successful later? So Jamaica was the, 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 the I would say, the, the root of where it all began. Jamaica is where the values of my Christian faith and my family values were. Um, we didn't have Christmases with gift. It was Christmas with family and a nice warm meal and we're going to drink and play some sports or, or a, a family game after that. Or we'll just go down the street corner until mom says it's time to go home. Or a street dance, which later on when I got older. But it, it, Jamaica was pretty much at that time conformed around family, community, and, and our parents just try to keep us out of trouble. Mm. 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 So you moved here to the States, and I'm assuming... I'm just saying, Florida, I don't know if it was Florida, but you moved to the States, you were 17. Yes. It's a cultural shift coming from Jamaica, coming from that family oriented world where you kind of knew where things were, you know how things worked. Mm -hmm. Why did you know? Tell us the story of migrating to the States and what you had to get used to or how to conform to or what, what was that experience was like? So it was a total culture shock because I, I, I moved from Jamaica, the warm island, to the windy city of Chicago, Illinois. Um, so that's where I migrated first. My, my grandmother was there. And it so happens that it, 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 this was truly a making of God where I, I got a college so um, scholarship to, to play soccer. And my mom said, Pete, the type of person that you are, I'm not sending you off to, to college on your own. It so happens that it was around the same time frame that my grandmother was doing what we call filing. So my grandmother was filing for me to actually move to the United States. So right out of high school, I only worked in Jamaica for about a year as a young adult and then moved at the age of 17. Um, because in Jamaica, we go to high school at age 10 and 11. So I was done with high school by the age of 16. Wow. So, um, yeah, so we go to high school early. So when I went to high school, I was a little, uh, what we would say, uh, a young boy that my nickname in Jamaica was Stumpy. If you're around close family, they call me still Stumpy because I was so short going to high school and all the other guys were a little bit taller. Mm. Um, so I migrated uh, at the age of 17. I never forget it, Grant. It was March the 31st was my evening flight leaving out of Jamaica into Chicago and in those days, when you arrived at immigration at the airport, you'd get your green card at the airport. All of that has changed now. You, know, you would have to go home and they'll get your green card in the mail now. I actually sat at the airport at the immigration office and they gave us our green card at the airport. 
Um, so my first official day in America was April the 1st. And that was the first time I'm kind of really understanding All Fools Day, where they call it April Fools. Oh, yeah. Um, right. Yeah. And, and, and I, I looked back then and I said, God, were you truly saying this was real for April the 1st? which is considered an All Fools Day for me to move to the United States. Um, and then the journey from there began as later and later. So I'm not sure if you want me to go down into what happened like a couple of months after moving to the so States. I want you to stay in the highlights, meaning yeah. that's a shift. Now I, now, I live in Miami, right? There's a lot of you know people from the Caribbean, a lot of people that come from all over. And it's a shift to get used to American culture, things I'm used to in the daily, but I'm hearing you on this leadership track, that you had leadership, that you had athletic skills that helped you to mm -hmm. get things. I figure in Jamaica, man, that's like a big thing. Go to the United States and live there is like a big thing. Like, wow, you've made it. But yeah. you, like, did you go through like, ow, was this April Fool's Day? Because I don't know <laughs> if it's a good thing or not. It, 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 it was yes or no, and here's why. My mom gave me a, a, a gift for passing what we would call our exams from what we would say middle school to high school. Um, I, I, that's the interpretation I could put it for for American viewers. Um, but it was called Common Entrance in Jamaica, and I passed that exam to go to high school. And my mom gave me a gift to travel to Chicago. So when I migrated, it wasn't my first time traveling, but it was now my time saying, I'm not going back home until it's to visit. This is now my new, new home. So the transition was, was, was not so shocking because it wasn't the first time seeing the cold. But what was actually shocking was getting used to living in the cold. Yeah. And I remember my first day of college, I went to the Brown University at the time in Chicago on Campbell Street. And I went to college, my first day grant, in a pair of shoes, which we call in Jamaica Desert Clarks. It's, a, it's made by Clarks. It has a nice little leather top, but it's soft. Now, Grant, if you're from up north, you know during the winter time you cannot yeah. wear those shoes outdoor. It, it, it's not warm enough. My grandma said to me, Pete, don't wear those shoes. And I'm like, ah, you know, as a young boy, you're like, ah, oh, grandma don't know style, right? <laughs> Grab my toes froze, man. I've never <laughs> seen my toes froze so much. I literally walked with my, you see how what we penguins lift their entire feet up off the ground? Oh, That's yeah. how I was walking. My toes could not bend. So I would say that was the first aha moment, kind of truly understanding the reality that I'm now in a new land and this I have to adapt to the, the lifestyle and things change. Um, and that, I never forgot my, my, my toes being frozen my first day of college. And that, that, that was a hard moment of, I would say, the, the biggest change moving to Chicago. Let me ask you this. When you, because you, you've been in this training and leadership track for yeah. a while. I went to DeVry also. I went to DeVry in Kansas City. That's where I graduated. Nice. See? There you go. Yeah. 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 We got some commonality. Yeah. When you got into American society and you saw other, you know, let's say African Americans and what they were doing, did you feel that from a leadership perspective, were you able to have the same type of look and feel that you had in the Jamaican environment, or that's something you had to develop? Or tell me about how that all worked out for you. Now, Grant, that's where I would say. Um, stuff starts hitting the fan from a leadership perspective and it happened fast. And, and I never recognized it until I got out of that. So what happened is I, 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 I had family members who were already living in the States. So there's a process, right? So my mom, my grandma had nine kids and my, my mom was the only child at the time that was married. So everybody actually migrated to Chicago before my family. So when I moved to Chicago, I already had cousins in high school doing all these things because, you know, they were a little bit younger. Um, so I, I, I easily transitioned into the community because my cousins were already living there. But what happened is that there was a cousin of mine who dated a, a, a drug dealer at the time. And um, we got very close. And, and, and we were a part of a gang that was called Gangster Disciple. And that's when leadership kicked in again. I was actually brought into the gang at a high level because of my education, also the way how I thought of things. And they were like, yo, we don't need you on the street. We need you in the conversations. 
um, that very same level is what gave me the access to lead the gang. So I was easily put into things just for an access because of the leadership qualities that I displayed, even at the gang level. Um, so when we talk about in Jamaica playing sports, leading my high school soccer team, leading my community team, and moving to Chicago, and, and about two months later, being given an opportunity to lead at in, in, in the mid level of a gang. Um, to me, from a from a young boy in Jamaica, I felt I don't hit the, the, the lottery, right? I had all the access to all the all the drugs there is. I had access to all the women there is. I was giving out directions. Um, there were there were weeks that I didn't even drive my car because I would drive somebody else's car because of the level we had. Um, and I enjoyed that leadership. I was like, this is cool, right? Um, again, no type of direction. But I saw leadership there. I saw camaraderie amongst men. I saw process. I saw objectives. I saw results. But they weren't the one that truly let us live a fulfilled life. Um, so that was, a, 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 I would say, from a, a far left to a far right, as what we can call them. And I would say that I migrated March the 31st. And by May, 22nd, which was my birthday, my 18th birthday, grad, I was wanted for murder. And I try, I try to clear it up to say that I didn't kill anyone. I like to make sure because some yeah. people can't really understand that. What happened is that because of the leadership quality that I had, I was buying cars in my name because I was the only legal one amongst my friends. So those were some of the access I gave them and some of the things that I allowed them to do where they saw, wow, this guy was a leader because I had two, three cars on the block that you would use to go do what you have to do and come back, not realizing that if anything happened, Grant, who they're going to look for? Yeah. Name is on the so, yeah. So what happened is that, you know, a, a fellow a fellow comrade we have mine, you know, rest in peace, um, he was murdered in a vehicle that was registered in my name. I was in school at the time. And, you know, the first person they look for is a registered owner. And, you know, after all the conversation and investigation, they realized I was in school. And I just told them, hey, you know, I just loaned the car to a friend. You know, when you're young, I say, hey, I loaned the car to my friend. I don't know who's driving the car if he loaned the car to somebody else. But And, and that ended it. Um, it was scary. Uh, it was rough. It, it was different. But um, God was still saying to me, Peach, you had this thing in you but you're just not using it in the right place. So I went from far left to far right from my experience as a young boy moving from Jamaica. I want you to really, I, I want our young viewers specifically to hear what you said. Meaning it on the outside, it looked like you had everything. This is like, yeah. wow, I got all this at my disposal. I've been given all this responsibility. This is great. However, this is a criminal society. Yep. Mm -hmm. and if it could be life and death yep and and obviously you got into a situation you were able to 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 get out of somebody else didn't as you just said mm -hmm. right? yep and and i want people to understand here's the question i have for you pete and i want you to go back in the mindset that you were why did you feel the need to join a gang in the first place love Oh. I was looking for love. I was yearning for love. And it goes back to Jamaica where my dad always from men were connected. The, the, the one thing in my observation, experience and studies grant is men were connected or let me not say that men were created to connect. Right. And this is why we love sports. Right. And, and that's why before women got into sports, the earlier years, it was all about men. And I tell people, sports haven't changed over the years. Soccer is still kicking a ball in the net. We're watching the World Cup this season. Basketball is still trying to put a ball in the hoop. Hockey is still trying to put that put in the net. It's just that we have creative coaches who come up with strategies to put the ball or whatever put in that net in a more strategic way. But at the end of the day, each team is trying to do what? Put that pot or that ball in the net. And for years, it hasn't changed. And you will have men buy season tickets for them and them families. And they will go to these games religiously. You know why? 
They had an opportunity to express themselves. They had an opportunity to cheer without any judgment. They had an opportunity. If I wanted to put my, a mask on and go in and act a fool, I would do that and no one judge me. Sports is a safe place for men to get away. So I realized that as men connect, when I joined the gang, just like I look for this thing in my father as a young man growing up, I found this love in the gang. I could cop when I was a part of the GDs grant. I if you could if you blew on me and I wanted to do something, it was just a phone call. There was so much support in that specific, I would say, in in, in that in, in that in that world or that lifestyle that it's it's the very same love and support we need outside. Right. So I was supported and found the love that I was looking for so long that made me feel like, wow, this is it. And then because I was at the level where I could really escape under the radar, I wasn't on the streets, what we would say, you know, selling dime bags, so to speak. Um, I felt this was an opportunity to make some money, still live a little life and not be seen, not realizing I'm still being seen. Yeah. Yeah. And very risky. Hi. Risk. Um, so I, we're, uh, we're going to talk about what you're doing now, you know, that transition and how you're leading men in our youth, you know, mm -hmm. to lead a better life, to live a better life, because you've seen it from all these sides. And man, I think I've heard anyone frame it like you said. I've heard a little bit about that people get community out of the game and they, they get something that they need that they did, even though. But dude, you know, you're risking a lot by yes. doing this. Yes. It could affect you for the rest of your yep. life. Yep. If you get out of it. But then you're like, all right, is our community not giving our youth and our men and obviously our women enough because they're they're choosing this this ulterior lifestyle that ultimately could destroy you? So yep. we're gonna go to break. We're gonna talk more about what you're doing now. That sound good? Yes, sir. Yep. All right. Let's have a commercial break and we'll come right back. Yes, yes, yes. Follow the Brand TV broadcast host, Grant McGaw, as he visits with top executives and problem is that the task and the monumental nature of the challenge is so great that I, so many people are in a, a two-track world. They've got to deliver now and learn now. And there really isn't the, you know, a certification when there's great places like Cornell and it, that will give you the academic knowledge, which is necessary, of course but it won't give you the knowledge to do something right the second and to make key decisions without fear of negative repercussions. I started Gateway Healthcare Solutions to help medical facilities to improve their financial performance. GHS has a healthcare denial prevention strategist practice designed to improve healthcare financial services, offering denial management and business development with a strategic approach of mechanisms for hospitals, clinics, and providers on how to maximize payer contractual agreements. We are a growing firm with a demonstrated record of success with our client projects by leveraging our wide-ranging skills and expertise to assist with delivering high-quality services such as denial management, revenue cycle management, strategy consulting, management training, 
medical software, and contract management. Our approach offers an analysis of your current state coupled with a proven solution and execute with a process and proven strategy and implementation methodology for our clients. GSS develops an understanding of its customers' problems by identifying, assessing, and tailoring the services to suit the business needs. Selecting the right healthcare solutions advisor can bring you the management services you need and peace of mind you deserve. Call us today for a free consultation. I know Bernadette. All right, we are back. We are yes, back. yes. This has been interesting, intriguing, actually, because you took us through the real mindset, mm -hmm. young man. You know, coming from Jamaica, getting involved with uh, a very well-known gang, been around for a long time, yep. led you now to a major chart that could have affected you the rest of your life without question. Take us now through how you got through that and then begin to help our youth to make better choices. I, I got through that by one thing, an experience. The man who I yearned to build a relationship through love, which led me to the gang, I was on that street corner one day and got a phone call from my brother who lives in Jamaica to tell me that my dad had passed away. Oh, wow. And um, that hit me hard. The reason being is um, even though we didn't develop that relationship that I desire, we started to communicate man to man. And, and I really love that. Um, a matter of fact, because the lifestyle I was in at that time, he was the only one that I could send my money to because my mom was, I'm not with it. I'm, I'm not about it. I don't want to be a part of it. Uh, don't give me no money. My mom was that Christian that she's going to pray through this. Um, work two jobs in the snow in Chi town And I, there's many days I've given her money. And she says, if you don't come get it, I'm giving it away or I'm burning it. So I had to go pick it up because I figured I could give it to some girl and enjoy it more than she giving it away. My mom was just not a part of that. So when I got that phone call, Grant, tore me up. I sat on the street corner and I said, man, I'm a walking dead. I'm, 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 I'm out here hiding from the cops. I'm out here hiding from rival gangs. You know, Chicago is full of vice lords and Latin kings and folks and all these other gangs that that, that you have to be aware of. Um, and also you have to be aware of the guy who is just the, the, the robber man, who is just, he's just looking to take something. Yeah. Um, and I, I saw myself and I said, I'm a walking dead. And I sat on the street corners and I remember saying to myself, Grant, Pete, this has to change. And the change was hard. Because at that time I was selling crack cocaine, the money was good. I wish I had somebody tell me pay off my school loan now, Grant, because I wouldn't be filing for it for 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 uh, school loan forgiveness, right? It, it, it's it's these are the little things I'm saying. I wish somebody had told me. But then when I sat there and I said I needed to have this change, it was hard. The money was good, the lifestyle was good, but I was still in school. That DeVry University, I kept going to school because I didn't want to disappoint my mom. And I said, okay, I'm going to switch it up. Rather than sell crack cocaine, I'm going to sell marijuana because I'm used to marijuana from Jamaica. Marijuana is less impactful on the mind and the, com and, and the people because I saw what crack cocaine did to others. Um, so I changed up my lifestyle and I started growing locks. When I graduated from DeVry, I graduated from DeVry with locks, dreadlocks. Started to grow locks and you've heard Rastafarian as we were singing right before we started our live show, One Love from Bob Marley. So from my understanding and learning from marijuana, I didn't think it had that much impact on others. So let me say, hey, rather than looking at a 95 job, I could put some money in the marijuana and, and, and start living that lifestyle. So I transitioned and started to read a lot more about Rastafarian and the lifestyle. And all of that led back to love. Rastafarian is love. So when I kind of look back in my life, I'm like, Pete, this leadership and love thing has been with you ever since. And this is why I tell people your talents and the thing that you tap into, God has given it to you from birth. What I help do is reignite that because it's always been there. How do I get you to tap into that thing? 
So then I started to go into my friends and I started to tell them about this lifestyle and how they can change and how they got to do a little bit more of love and, and how when you come on the street corner, you don't have to carry a gun with you. But if you're going to hustle, I understand that. I'm not going to tell you. Though. And one of them looked at me, Grand, and said, look here, man, you was on the street corner with us three months ago doing this. What you talking about, CJ? And I remember going home and God told me, you cannot make the change here, P, because they already have a perception and an image of you. Mm. Yeah. He says, I'm going to have to take you out. And I said, no, God. Honestly, I said, Grant, no, here's why. Is my mom and my grandma had moved to Florida. Oh. And that was the place to go. And I had finished college. October the 25th, 2002, I finished, graduated from college. And that was the turning point. On that day, I figured out the secret sauce to life. Mm. And the secret sauce to life is to forgiveness. If you can forgive, you'll be able to tap into your talent and your talent will lead you to your passion. So while I was in the gang, what happened to me as well is um, I was robbed and shot by my very own gang members because they wanted me to rob a Latin King Hispanic friend who I met in school at the Vry, and we became tight. We almost fought in the cafeteria till this leadership in me turned it around that he became my number one client and he became my best friend. Wow. And G friends wanted me to rob him. And I said, no. I said, are you guys serious? How are we going to rob somebody who we don't have to go on the street corner anymore, especially for me? Um, and I was shot and almost lost my life because of that. I didn't wow. want to rob him. And um, when he found out, that I almost lost my life because of that. The Hispanic family is also very close. I start, I met his mom. I met everybody in the family afterwards. And I told myself, Pete, this has to change because there's something more in me. And there was a guy, Mr. Cooley, I put him in my book, Mr. Cooley, who um, we stand on the street corner and he came to me one day and said, CJ, I want to sell you the store. And I went to the higher ranking leaders in the gangster disciple and said this. And they said, no, we're not realtors. We're gangsters. Again, the mindset was a little bit different. And then I started separating myself a little bit. And um, on October the 25th, the guy who shot me walked up to me in front of the entire park where everybody's watching. Everybody know I'm looking for him. Everybody know I wanted to grant. I, I've repeated this many times, but my mindset has changed. At that moment, I was going to have what, I, what we call in the island. I was going to have a head on my hand. Mm. I made a decision I was going to kill somebody because mm. they wanted to take my life for something that I think wasn't fair. And my own best friend, and this is why we say mentorship sometimes sits beside you, and the teacher shows up once the actual student is willing to learn. And my best friend um, said to me, Pete, leave them alone. I, I looked at him, I was like, are you, man, are you serious? Um, we went to the same high school. We grew up in Jamaica and now he was in Chicago with me and we were doing a little bit of the hustle. And, um, but I tried to keep him out of it as much as possible because I understood that he wasn't in the same position as in me if he got caught. Mm. Uh, and then I was protecting him at a different level because I understood there are certain parts of the game I didn't want him to get into and the money was already coming in. Again, leadership, right? Seeing all of that, rather than saying, let's make more money. I'm like, no, it's not about the money. I want to protect you differently. And he's the same one that turned around and tell me to forgive them. He's the same one. And he wasn't there on October the 25th when the guy walked up to me because he had moved to, to Boston to be with his family. He had met a young lady and they were now having a kid. So he had moved to Boston and, and Grant that night crossed the, the, the stage in Chicago there. We actually had the uh, ceremony down by um, the, the pier. Remember that pier off? Um, well, you know, I'm saying remember because I thought you were from Chicago. You just said DeVry. But DeVry has this pier. It's called Navy Pier downtown. And we had the, the, the graduation ceremony there. And that night I went back to the park to have a smoke and a drink. And the guy who shot me is walking across the park. It's like a movie scene. He's walking and everybody's watching and everybody starts to get close to see what is CJ going to do? And he walked up to me and said something blew my mind. I never knew what he was going to say. And he asked for forgiveness. He said, CJ, didn't mean to shoot you. Please forgive me. And I can tell you, Grant, the only words I could find out of this little Christian boy who was raised in the church was, I, was, I forgave you. I forgive you. And um, instantly, I tell people, that's when 
I would say the Holy Spirit took over my life. And I tell people, you don't have to be in church for that to happen. You don't have to know tongues. You just got to call on the process of God and he'll step in. And um, my high went away. I couldn't smoke or drink after I had asked, after I had forgiven the guy. And I felt weird because, again, a leader in the park, this is happening. Let's not let the weirdness continue. I just jumped in my car and went home. And... Um, Years later, when I when I got filled with the Holy Ghost again, I remember it and I sat on that altar till about 1.30 that morning um, because I said, God, I remember this feeling. You have to take me back. And he says, you remember when you asked, I'm not sorry, when the guy asked you for forgiveness and you said, yes, I forgive you, that was me. And I was like, whoa. Um, and ever since then, I, I, I don't hold things again, people. My friends know I'm the, I'm the first one to say I'm sorry. I'm the first one to check in if you're okay. Did I offend you? Um, and this is why I read body language as well, because I can easily see if something is off that I'll be able to kind of connect with it to kind of bring you back. Um, and that's where some of that transition happened. And then I moved into um, doing some lessons and then I came over to Miami or I would say Fort Lauderdale area. And you know what happened? God Four. burned down my apartment. Before we go there, because you've, you've given us the story to how that, and that's a heck of a, that intersection I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. That's a heck of an intersection that you just talked about uh, for sure. That, so I think a lot of people, when you see your, the enemy that you have pictured right in front of you, that has done you harm ah. and you're able to forgive, that is a divine intervention. There's no doubt about that. So we're going to hold on to that. We're going to go to break. And then when we come back, I, I got you got to tell people what you're doing with your program, yes. what's coming up, what your training and leadership is all about. Yes. And you're doing big things and yes. great stories. So thank you very much. All right. Follow the Brand TV broadcast host, Grant McGaw, as he visits with top executives and entrepreneurs to find out their secrets of success with their personal brand. Follow the Brand TV broadcast host as he focuses on brand development to build better relationships, bring value to your business, relationships, and career. You will enjoy listening to each episode that is tailored to speak to you directly. If you're looking for this type of clarity in terms of building your brand, you have tuned into the right station. Each episode will help you to shape a conversation in the five-star BDM network of 20,000 professionals and become a springboard for your corporate engagement and business opportunities. Each guest will frame their story in the areas of personal branding, business development, career development, financial empowerment, and technology innovation. Grant McGaw explains why he is the CEO and owner of his own professional career. Grant is an accomplished business leader and entrepreneur who wants to give back to individuals to grow their personal brand strategy. Tune in as he weaves his story about new possibilities while to you exceed expectations. If you love storytelling, this show will make for fun. Five Star BDM, Brand Development Master. Five Star BDM, Brand Development Masters, is a professional consulting and advisory group keenly focused on business development services for the small to mid-sized business and entrepreneurs. Although every business is unique, they often share business development challenges that can be addressed through smart branding. Services include process improvement and operations, digital strategy and transformation, business intelligence, digital marketing, and personal branding. Our business and personal branding company has helped a number of professionals and organizations to optimize and grow. This results in more business, more opportunities, better reach, positive outcomes. Visit www.5starbdm.com today to learn more. All right. So yes. you, you got to like, you know, bring, bring us full circle, right? 
you're an author now. Yeah. You're doing a lot of work in the community. You're bringing that love. You, you know, you, you, you've lived it in your own experience, what love really is, and you're bringing that to other people. Talk to me about what you're doing. What we're doing right now is actually something um, right out of my company, which is called Emil, Educating Men and Youth How to Lead and Live. And we're just taking leadership from the goggles of love. Um, I've came up with a quote that is called, leadership is love, love is leadership. And it doesn't mean that we can't lead without love, but we're more effective with love. And I always tell leaders, especially, that before we become CEOs and presidents or even a supervisor or a manager or even a team lead, we're brothers and sisters and cousins. And sometimes we become parents before some of that. So leadership starts at home. And that was my biggest, I would say, learning point when I got into the corporate world is I realized that professionally I was growing and personally I was not. And I was walking in balance and we were created to do that. And I had to stop and say, why is it that I can help somebody at work to be great? But then my relationship fails. And I actually did one of the, I would say, most profound thing in my life, one off, because I've done many, is um, to seek therapy. I went and seek therapy. And again, come back to sports, right? We just saw Poliski from the United States team got hurt in the game when he scored the goal and he had to go see a doctor or a therapist because he got injured. Yeah. Now, once he got injured and they actually checked him out and he was okay, then they say, hey, Christian Poliski, for you to play the game on Saturday, you got to go back to coaching, which means that you got to go out the field and practice. We got to see you kick the ball. We got to see the strength in you before we could put you back. Just like in basketball or any sport, if you're injured, they take you to a doctor or a therapist before you ever come back to the game. And I've realized in life, we're skipping that therapist and the coaching piece, right? It's we're in the game, we're in the game, we're in the game. But when we get hurt, when we make decisions that are not the right one, we're not stopping and saying, hey, let me check with my mentor. Let me check with my therapist to see what is happening. And once you get back on track, come back to the coach. And then the coach will keep you online and say, all right, you're ready for your aim game. Let's go. Let's put you back into the life movement, right? And then we start keeping that. So I would tell people that, you know, for us, what we do here at Emil is all about making you understand your talents, which is your authenticity. No one is in this world like you, Grant. And our clients know if you don't show up, no one will show up for you. So you're doing an injustice to your family, number one. You're doing an injustice to your community. And not only that, you're doing an injustice to the reason why you were created. And all of us have a legacy to leave once you had life, right? So at Emil, we talk about tapping into that talent. Once you tap into that, that talent, which is self-identification, you'll find your passion, right? Um, I've, been, I've been a talker since playing soccer. That was my number one strength. They would say that defender talks a lot. I rarely did a lot of tackling in soccer because I would talk you out your game. And my coach knew this. He's like, Pete, go talk. And I would talk you out your game. I still was a skilled player, but my strength was, I would talk you out your game and people knew that. So now we actually tap into what is that talent that you have? Even though it may be sports or something else, what is the other thing that you can use to bring that strength? And then once we do that, we talk about how do you use that talent now to connect with those around you? Everybody in my, in my close circle know I am loud, I'm a talkative person, and I don't get offended if you tell me, Pete, it's not your time. I totally understand now. I've been matured, right? So we, we, we help people to understand, love who you are, but who you are doesn't fit in every space. So don't get offended if you go somewhere and somebody say, hey, it's not your time. Understand, it's just not your space. But the more matured you get in understanding who you are, the more you understand where your space belongs. Because now I know when I walk into a room and certain things is happening, Pete, it's just for you to take notes, ask questions, and leave, mm -hmm. right? Some rooms, it's Pete, you need to take notes and you need to get the mic. Somehow do something to get the mic that you can share. So I understand how to use Pete in the most effective way. And then the next thing is, when you understand that, how do you build the relationships? And there were so many, I tell people, there were relationships that I destroyed, Grant, all because I didn't know this authentic Pete, yeah. right? 
And because we don't know the authenticity of who we are, we offered a peel off 10 years ago. And I tell my business partner all the time, and I'm so happy to hear she's saying it now, is I say, hey, I will give you the best version of me every day because there's no way I'm going to give you the best version of me 10 years ago when I've grown. And that means that if I'm working on being a man of my word, I'm working on processing, I'm working on being organized, everybody new that comes in my life get that opportunity. And that's where a lot of us feel, Grant, is we're not trying to offer new people in our life who God gives us an opportunity to meet every day, the new version of us, or the, I'm saying new, the best version of us. I think about how much people you meet, Grant. I see your page. Think of how much people you meet. If every person you met who were new, you and I just met in October. It's almost going on a little bit over a month. What if Grant had offered Pete the best version of him? I don't know Grant prior to October the 21st. What if you decided, you know what, no matter what I'm working on, I'm going to give this best version because I don't want to know the past and I've never asked for the past. But the only time the past comes up is when you bring that behavior over into the relationship. Sure. And then the last thing that we do is we tap that into confidence and we tap that into what we would call conflict management. Many of us don't know how to flex to kind of drive the desires and the results that we need. And that's where conflict management is actually done. So at email, our focus is talents that drives into gifts, that drives into passion, that drives into relationship, that drives into your authenticity, which is a legacy that you'll leave behind. Um, and we do that with all our young people at men. I think that is wonderful uh, what you're doing. Now, you're doing it for the youth. Are you doing it for anyone? Are you doing it for a particular like, community? Tell us how to get in touch with your organization. So our website is emil.org, E-M-Y-L-L.org. You can also visit us on Facebook at Lead Emil. The very same is for Instagram, Lead Emil. Or you can follow me, Pete Kennedy, on Facebook or Pete Andre Ken on Instagram. Um, what we actually also try to do is um, make the connection for anyone in the community. Majority of our clients are females because a lot of men run from the word love and God told me don't change it. So when they run from love, the, the wife and the daughter or the sister, I've seen many sisters come and say, my brother needs this or my grandpa needs this. Um, when we make the connection with them and they see the change, then it's easy for the guys to adapt. So now we've had um, a perennial of guys that we've actually dealt with that now they're spreading the word amongst to actually get those clients. So we actually focused on anyone because... I have sisters. I would love somebody to, you know, would have helped my sisters to really tap into their talent and get them to that next level. So we don't discriminate. We actually appreciate well, it. Uh, Pete, this has been wonderful. I'm glad you shared your story, shared your journey. I encourage an entire audience. Number one, yes. this will be available on my YouTube, uh, on Follow the Brand TV series on YouTube. So you can play that recording over and over again. Get yep. it into the right hands. Get it into people that need to hear their story. Get it, just because you're on the wrong path right now doesn't mean you're going to continue on, on that yeah. path. And it's just a matter, as you said earlier, that you finally get to that right mentor, that, that right voice that yeah. you heard, and then you were able to make some pivots and, and make some changes in your life that that brings you to bring you to your point you can be your authentic, full stuff so yeah. thank you very much for being on the follow brand tv thank you thank you thank you and i encourage our entire audience that they can see all our episodes at www.5starbdm that's b for brand b for development and for masters.com you have a blessed 2022 and into 2023 thank you for having me Grant. thank you
Hey everyone, it's Grant McGall, CEO of Five Star BDM and host of the award winning Follow the Brand podcast and TV. Hey everyone, it's Grant McGall, CEO of Five Star BDM and host of the award winning Follow the Brand podcast and TV series, where I help you to build a five star brand that people will follow. My genius is personal brand development through intelligent communication and helping you achieve your business and career goals. I am a requested speaker on digital technology and brand development issues. I want to work with you to increase the value of your current opportunities while attracting new ones. Every one of you is unique and we all share challenges that can be addressed through smart branding. As a super connector, I work with you as an executive coach to guide you along the complicated business and career development road, providing the enhancement tools and information you need to succeed. Together, I will help you succeed in today's challenging business climate. I will evaluate and measure your progress. Best of all, I am right alongside you every step of the way. Build the brand called you. Genius.